you to fill in your reflections about uh, week number three. The, the title here is wrong, but it doesn't matter. The, the questions are all the same. So there are two links at the, this slide, uh, one for the interactive students and one for the observer students. We would like to kindly ask you to go to those links and fill up your uh, in impressions for the real neurons day. And we will be waiting for five minutes until you do that. And then we start discussing any of the exciting things that you have to ask our panelists. Okay, so we start counting on the five minutes now. Welcome Arvin, welcome Taro, welcome Andrian. I think everyone is here now. So while the students are filling in their questions, it will be very nice to introduce all of us. So I will start with Rishi. Uh, please uh, fill in if I forget any of the important information. So Rishi Narayanan, he is a professor of molecular biophysics uh, at the Molecular Biophysics Unit at the Indian Institute of Science. And he's working a lot on building biophysical models to study how real neurons and networks integrate information and compute. Taro, welcome Taro. Taro Toyozumi, he's, I hope I'm spelling this correctly. He's, <laughs> good, thanks. He's a PI at the Riken Institute in Japan and he's using techniques like statistical physics and information processing to study uh, the processes that take place in real neurons. Arvind Kumar, Arvind is a content creator for uh, the Real Neurons Day, thank you Arvind. He's an associate professor at KTH in Sweden and he's studying the dynamics uh, of neural systems, neural networks using information processing theory, statistical mechanics, probability theory, graph theory, and many other difficult things that are very hard for me to understand. And I'm sure he will explain if we have questions. Then we have Andrian Ferhol from the US. She's a professor of physiology and biophysics at the University of Washington. And Adrian is in fact also the director of the computational neuroscience program at the University of Washington and a number of other things in her title that were a bit too long to discuss. So <laughs> maybe she will tell us more about it. She's studying the dynamics of neural computations with a lot of uh, interesting theoretical techniques. And finally, Eric Dewey, he's a postdoc at Champalimont. He has his own team and he's studying the, uh, uh, using computational tools to understand behavior and especially with respect to learning and decision-making. And uh, he will talk to us about any questions related to these issues. So welcome everyone. And um, we are ready to start with your questions if you're done with answering your uh, reflections, putting in your reflections for the day. Please remember to use the Q&A button. So I would like to give the floor to the panelists if they want to briefly uh, introduce themselves until we start getting the first question. Um, Rishi, you can go first if you like. Oh, I'm looking already at some questions. Yes, uh, there are questions. Uh, I'm just reading through the questions. So. Okay. So the first question from Andy. Oh, it's an interesting question. How to model at one level and involve the knowledge we know about other levels? This is a challenging one. And, and it refers <laughs> to the multi-scale processing that takes place in real neurons. So who would like to take that question? If no one else wants to, I think um, just because I'm also one of the organizers of NMA and one of the things we've been very interested in is trying to frame how we use models. And so we've talked a little bit uh, at the beginning of the course about what models, how models and why models. And we also talked a little bit about these ideas of, of the Marian levels, so computation, algorithm and implementation. But there's another way of thinking about levels of models that um, actually I've worked with Arvind and Ricci on, on uh, summer school in India and I used to work on one in China. Um, and one of the things we like to, to try to, to help people think about is how we go from different just levels of description. So individual neurons are obviously very important but we can't use those same models to describe the whole brain. And so we have to start thinking about the relationships between what we understand about, say, how a single neuron works 
and how a population of neuron works. And one of the things we need to do is simplify as we go through those stages. And that was one of the things that um, we sort of tried to emphasize is these conceptual relationships. So I think that um, not just at the level of, of whether you're thinking about the abstract computations versus say an algorithm or an implementation, it's also important to think about how do we actually map back and forth between a model of say how uh, Synapse is working, which um, actually a colleague has worked with Richie and Arvind, uh, Upinda Baller, uh, has worked on you know looking at that from the, the dynamics of individual calcium molecules, right? And that isn't something that we could scale up to a whole brain. So here we've been using a particular abstraction, primarily the leaky integrate and fire neuron. And that is a level of description, right? It's a level of abstraction, but we can choose any level of abstraction that appro that's appropriate for our scientific question. And I think that's something that's really powerful to think about. You know, you don't have to include all of the details, but you have to think about which details you want to include and, and by doing so, you're sort of saying, this is the right level for us to think about for this particular kind of question. So here, um, there's some kinds of questions that, that, uh, that you could look at using the kinds of models you use today. Uh, but a classic example is that we can take the Hodgkin-Huxley model, which was, I think, mentioned earlier in the course, and reduce it to something like the leaky integrated and fire neuron. And by doing that, what we've done is we've, we've discarded some things that are are real, they're true. I like to say, this is the guess the first day we got real. Now, up until this point, we haven't been very close to the biology. But by discarding some of those things, it gave us the power of being able to think about networks or about how you know spike timing dependent plasticity worked because we could focus on these things at a, at a larger scale. And we could do that again and again until we get up to thinking about you know, uh, mass neural models, for example, that, that would describe hundreds of neurons um, in some statistical average way. So I don't know whether that was completely what the, the, the student was thinking about, but I think that you always want to think about whether the level of abstraction you're using, what you're keeping and what you're discarding is appropriate for the kinds of questions you're interested in investigating. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. The, th the second question I think is kind of related and already answered by Eric, which is how to incorporate biological models with more abstract models that we touched on last week. Um, so I think that was partially answered in, uh, in this uh, discussion. Okay, well, that's another interesting one. Why don't we apply the model of real neuron to models like deep learning? What are the, <laughs> what are the most important issues that <laughs> stop us from doing that? Who would like to take that? Adrian? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there are reasons not to do it. It just hasn't been um, the first port of call, right? So when you build, when people build neural networks, uh, historically, they've used very simplified models. But I think that we are at a point where where that, you know, that goal of incorporating some of the computations that we've seen in real neurons into deep networks, or at least, you know, maybe not deep networks, but, you know, various kind of artificial neural networks is very much a frontier of, of current research. You know, there was a nice paper that one of our uh, former postdocs, Guillaume Lejoie, uh, just put out where he incorporated um, biophysical type adaptation into individual neurons and showed that that um, that gave you a network that has, you know, that's more rapidly able to learn, for example. And I, I, so I think that's an extremely exciting and cool new direction that, you know, that I think really comes back very nicely to, to how Eric laid out kind of the goals that we have in computational neuroscience that what, you know, in my lab, the kinds of um, approaches that we've taken have been to sort of start to add in biological detail and try and see if we can find simplified ways of understanding how that biological detail creates computational motifs. And at the same time, one can come from the network perspective and ask, well, how do I incorporate those computational motifs into a neural network? And it may never be the approach that you just put all the details into the neural network. Maybe you can use your understanding from the lower level to simplify away the fundamental computation that's being carried out by a single neuron and incorporate that idea into the neural network. So I think it's a nice example really of, of this sort of multi-layer thinking that, that Eric
Yes, uh, that, that's a great, uh, um, a great explanation, Adrian. I think a part of the discussion was also what are the negative, what are some of the reasons why we don't do that right now? And the computational cost, for example, is one of the reasons mentioned and whether we have more unknown parameters and mechanisms and things like that, which is also true, right? I mean, especially yeah. for the neuron I mean, types. Certainly not where you would, you'd never start with a more complicated model if you can you know, start with a simplified one. And people have learned through, you know, applications of neural network theory and, and fitting over the last many years that you can do an incredible amount without, inc without including that kind of detail. I think where um, we have this very interesting frontier is, you know, if we want to understand how the details of single neurons and the way they may be modulatable, for example, by neuromodulators or by, you know, by the other influences, how that might act to change the way that a neural network computes, that's where it starts to be critical to put in those details. Yeah, absolutely. I can add just one sentence to that. Um, I think one important aspect is how to train the network. And uh, these days people use back propagation learning for to train AI, that's fine. Um, but uh, when, uh, when you, you are going to use uh, realistic neurons, how you're gonna train that? Are you going to use a hybrid of back propagation and the more complicated neurons? Or you wanna do train the network with a more biological plausible way? Um, there are various sorts of um, approximations to back propagation algorithm, but uh, I guess so far none of them are as good as the, the back propagation learning. So, I mean, how to how to train the more biologically plausible network is an outstanding question um, that is really fascinating. I think. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Taro. Um, okay, there's a lot of exciting things to ask here. I, I would, I think this is a, a question for uh, for Rishi. Can you give some examples where you model neurons in your research and explain to us why you do it this way? Let's say. Okay, so um, my lab uses computational models uh, um, for both making predictions as well as for uh, um, describing things. Basically, there are two types of models. Uh, descriptive models and predictive models. Uh, so my lab is a combination of both experimental as well as uh, computational, uh, um, uh, uses both computational and experimental techniques. Uh, so one of the things that we use computation is to understand the concept of what's called as degeneracy. Um, so this was a concept that was proposed by Edelman and Ghali. Um, so this was a paper in uh, PNAs in 2001. Uh, so the idea being that um, uh, different structural components, combinations of different structural components uh, can come together to elicit the same function. Uh, while this has been uh, something that has been explored in, um, in uh, um, uh, simpler nervous systems and in uh, the immunology field uh, much more, uh, the mammalian nervous system has not been looking at this concept, which is uh, at the core of uh, robustness in biological systems uh, as effectively basically. Right? So we have been, uh, exploring this concept in hippocampal uh, uh, neurons, uh, asking questions about how uh, the same function or similar function could be achieved uh, by different combinations of ion channels. Uh, so that is one line of research that we do. The second line of research is very similar to what Yota does, um, uh, where we look at active dendrites. Uh, the question is why do neurons express uh, so many different ion channels with so much heterogeneity in terms of their expression profiles? Uh, and one of the questions uh, that we address in our laboratory is uh, about what exactly happens when specific ion channels are present in these neurons uh, and how do they uh, enable um, the, the, the enormous increase in the computational power of these structures. Uh, what happens when um, these ion channels change in response to activity patterns and how does it uh, enable neurons to store memory, not just through changes in synaptic strength, uh, but also because of changes in these um, ion channel properties and their uh, 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 densities, basically, right? So, so, uh, so I mean, uh, it's a uh, combined, as I said, electrophysiological and computational technique. Uh, uh, without taking too much time, I hope that answers uh, broadly the questions. I can go into the individual details, but that will take a long time. Uh, so. Oh, thank you, Rishi. I think uh, let's leave the details for the end if we have more time. And, and the next, I think it's a more technical one that is uh, should be addressed to Arvind, if I may. 
um, when one computes functional connectivity at the cellular level with calcium imaging, for example, one uses calcium transient correlation threshold to identify some fa such functional connectivity. How could the content of tutorial two help us define more detailed, more detailed rules for functional connectivity? There are many different ways. What is the best one to address this problem essentially? And how can we capitalize on the content of tutorial two to do so? Arvind, would you like? I think you're muted. Uh, I think you are still muted. I, can you unmute? Yes. Is this okay now? Okay. I really don't know how to take this question because functional connectivity is correlation one way or the other. There's no other definition of functional connectivity, whether you use cross correlation measurement, whether you use some other distribution based measures like mutual information or transfer entropy and whatnot. Um, the purpose of tutorial two, when you are looking into correlations, is to highlight the fact that uh, how um, input correlations go to the output, meaning how neurons integrative properties influence it. That's the purpose of the tutorial. So. Uh, we didn't really go into what it means to calculate cross correlograms, uh, uh, how to correct for all various uh, uh, problems that arise in measurement of correlations. So I really don't know if uh, tutorial two will help you uh, what functional connectivity is, but uh, what it will help you is that where it might come from if it is there. Yeah, if I could add something, I was going to say that that I think the important thing here is that you know, this is an example where if you thought you had functional connectivity in a network, you could set up a network and induce a set of correlations, which you know in advance, right? This is the advantage of going in simulation for, you know, up rather than analysis down. When you, when you start with a neural data set, some of you may have been trying to do this with either fMRI data in your projects or say with, with Carson's data and calcium imaging, you could look for correlations, but you would only ever be able to see those correlations here, if you were to expand this kind of model, you could induce correlations, then you could try to measure them using the kinds of tools we use to, to measure functional connectivity, or you could use something like Granger causality to try to infer the causal connections. But here you could, you could use the ground truth that you know because you've written the model, you've connected up the network, and so you would have access to both the physical connections and the functional connectivity that you've added via the structure of the network's communication and the correlations you're inducing. So that's one way that it might be able to help you disentangle these things. But of course, as Arvind was saying, I mean, functional connectivity in the end just, you know, it, it breaks down to looking at correlation structures over time in neurons. And so it doesn't really answer that question. It's just a way of sort of maybe being able to think through whether what you're seeing as functional connectivity might or might not relate to real connectivity, if that helps. Great, I hope it does. <laughs> I see a question here that is rather general, but it seems like many people would like to get an answer, which is for someone to give uh, general principles on how to design artificial neural networks. If some of us, someone <laughs> can discuss, what are the basic principles to build up different neural networks? Ah, nice book. <laughs> this, this, this is Maculoc. I think he already gave us the general principle. <laughs> Rest is all the detail that we have been trying to work out. You, you should give you should give those people who aren't yet familiar a little bit more detail. What I mean is that Maclock and Pitts they gave us the neuron model. They already made an abstraction of biological complexity, gave us the so-called artificial neural network, and rest is how to tune the synapses. Right. This is the general principle that came out of these guys. Right. But but there's been uh, some time since then, right? Uh, what, uh, 50 years or more, 60 years by now. So we must have some improvements on those basic, basic principles, right? What are those? Uh, I, I go back don't to... see any big change. Uh, I think we are still in the same paradigm. OK, someone is asking on the chat, what is the name of the book? Okay. It's a book of Maculog, actually. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think one thing that I would recommend for all students to do is, and you can even start on like the Wikipedia page for neural networks, is to to look back through the history of the big moments in neural networks. Right, we had you know some some basic insights into to neurons starting at the turn of the last century, and it took about fifty years before someone came up with a pretty simple mathematical model that allowed us to think about a network. And, and these were the most simple models you could possibly imagine, simply a neuron that's a one or a zero. And the connections were what we looked at. And in some ways, the, I think the history since then has been going in, in kind of two parallel directions. One is, how do you use those kinds of very simple models, but build really big networks that can do interesting things? And you know, there was a big birth of this in the 80s when um, you know, back propagation, the idea of using gradient descent to train networks allowed you to train multi-layer networks and to train the networks to do more exciting things. But the neurons themselves were just simply uh, now sigmoidally activated uh, real numbered units. They were not much more biological, but they were uh, at least capable of using this new approach to train complicated networks. And then on the other side, you had, you know, Hodgkin and Huxley writing down biophysical models and other people working on biophysical models. And that has grown up into, you know, being able to model active dendrites and to be able to model all of the complicated processes we think are going on in real neurons. But that's been largely an independent research project in some sense. And as was pointed out, you know, the connection between this thing we've been using since the 80s to train networks, gradient descent in various forms, and what we think is going on in the biological neurons, there's still a disconnection there. We don't really have any fundamental insight yet um, beyond that we, we believe something like, you know, heavy in synaptic plasticity that we can model at this, at the synaptic level biologically. And we have this gradient descent that allows us to train networks to do amazing things like automatically help us translate the, the audio into text in your YouTube videos. But these have not yet been brought together very many times in in sort of deep ways but i guess it's sort of at both levels there's been an interaction between as you know rishi's lab works on like connecting biological work and and experimental uh work with computational models um and that's sort of i do decision making and the reason i got interested in decision making is i use reinforcement learning models and reinforcement learning models are one of the few places where at the implementation level we can look at the biology and we can look at dopamine neurons which you heard about last week and we see something that relates the sort of details of the biology to the details of the implementation of this computational model. And we can go up a level and sort of think about it at the algorithmic level and say, okay, where do we store value? And we see areas in the brain that see the reflection of this. And then we can ask the why question, sort of why do animals do things? Well, maybe they're trying to maximize their long-term reward or their average reward. But this is the only place in neuroscience where I think that kind of, um, interaction has been happening well. And instead, like in other areas, it tends to go sort of back and forth. Um, you know, when Hinton and, and Diane were working on, on the Hemholtz machine and they were starting to think about sort of how to think about generative models and deep networks, they took the sort of generic simple um, multi-layer neural networks and started trying to connect them to something they thought might in some way relate to the way brains work. And this was part of what was the impetus for the deep net explosion, the other side being Facebook data, and Google data, and GPUs. But that, that, that sort of is like one of these periodic moments where there was some kind of connection in the neural network world. Um, and then they sort of diverge again. And then maybe we'll come back together again. But the system is incredibly complicated. And so I think it's just very hard. I don't know. Is that fair? Yeah. If not, let me add uh, one thing. I, I think it's very important to have uh, a theory that guarantees something like uh, a classical example is uh, perceptron right i mean single layer perceptron can classify uh, linearly classifiable problems but cannot solve let's say x or y problem so what is possible with single layer perceptron what is not possible with it and how to make it possible by making uh, two layer perceptrons um, that, that kind of theory um, helps to uh, understand the, the principle what is computable with the networks. Now, I mean, we are talking about more realistic neurons with biological elements, 
uh, and it would be nice to have an analog of that with more biologically plausible neuron, what kind of perhaps spatial temporal tasks are solvable with this kind of network architecture. That, that kind of thing will help us navigate, you know, um, what is required to solve a, a more realistic problems uh, in a more perhaps uh, energy efficient or wiring efficient ways. Right, and if I can add to that, we've seen in the last few years, a lot of people trying to figure out what is it in the brain that helps us solve problems using the very limited resources that we have in a small skull compared to a supercomputer system that uh, consumes a lot of energy. And people have been looking at both the architecture of neural systems that are dedicated to solving particular tasks, let's say the cerebellum or uh, um, you know, the motor cortex or, or the hippocampus, which is doing associative memory. So the architecture is one important thing. And the other important thing is the plasticity rules, which we haven't really explored in the past. We were looking mostly at gradient-based methods, but the brain is doing a variety of other things. And maybe the advantages are not obvious from the beginning, but it's definitely worth looking into this and coming up with ways that may provide benefits to the traditional neural network architectures. And I think we're seeing a few studies coming up with really nice results on, on these particular aspects. So just uh, my five cents on this. Okay, more questions coming in. Uh, one that I find really exciting is if we get the connections between all neurons, let's say the C elegans, and a general model of a single neuron, how far can we get to understand the brain? Who wants to take up this challenging question? I will start, but I, I think everyone else might chip in. Um, so, I mean, one, one sort of slight flaw in the setup of the question is that all the neurons in C. elegans behave somewhat differently. And so it won't be, unfortunately, as though you could just you know, model a be cortical neuron, even that's you know the wrong way to say it, right? Because there are many different types of cortical neurons, and they probably all have slightly different computational computational structures. So I think we are still a fair way from being able to even um, simulate C. elegans, although that's that's a very active area of research, because each individual neuron has somewhat different um, dynamical behavior. And as Kari Bagman and you know, others, Eve Mader and others have pointed out repeatedly, even knowing the connections and knowing the dynamics of a neuron in a particular state doesn't mean that you know what they do when there is neurotransmitters released or, or neuromodulators or neuropeptides that then affect the, the dynamics of those single neurons. And so, it's a very important step to have a connectome. And in fact, one can do amazing things actually, where right? you can make a neural network that's set up to have you know, a comparable um, set of connections and you can derive um, modes of dynamics of that network and show that they are approximately you know, related to what, what worms do. But understanding you know, exactly why the worm has the, the dynamics that it does is another question again. This sort of came up in the responses in the in the chat to um, to the last question. You know, what is your question exactly? You know, if it is, how much can I predict of the of the dynamics of the network from knowing the connectome? That's an answerable question. If it is, why does you know the the worm have this particular neuron and why does it have the behavior that it does? What computational power does that neuron add to the network? That's a completely different question and requires sort of diving down into the, into the biological detail. And so one can ask questions at many different scales and many different levels, and one can reach conclusions to questions if you frame them appropriately. I think the question of, do I understand the brain? is one that has many, many layers. And there are ways in which I do think we can understand the brain, but it won't mean that you understand everything about the brain. And someone will always be able to pose you a question that your current level of understanding does not address. And so that's where these additional layers and layers and layers of biology need to be, or eventually will need to be unraveled. Others want to take that? Uh, I want to say something here. I just hate this question whether I will understand the brain or not. I mean, this to me reminds of Douglas Adams. And answer is, of course, we know the answer then. 
uh, I think we should ask a question in a more educated way now that we know a lot more about the brain. In, so we can very easily pose good questions and uh, possibly answer them if we ask them at the component level. Like what does this component of the brain is doing? Like what is neuromodulators doing and, and things like that. Those questions make sense. This question doesn't make sense that whether we will understand the C. elegans brain. No, we don't. C. elegans itself doesn't understand its brain. Other thing is that uh, uh, the connectome, I think uh, it's an important uh, piece of the neural circuitry that we need to know. I mean, what else is the brain if it's not a network? But we should not forget that connectome is not a fixed entity. It changes, not just with plasticity. Adriana mentioned about uh, peptides and other neuromodulators. It just keeps changing. So it's not one connectome. So we will not go very far, but of course we will go to the extent that we can predict some behavior of the animal if you stimulated some neurons. That I'm pretty sure we will go up to that. Perhaps you should check the Open Worm project. I think they are making really good progress on this. Yeah, and I just wanted to add one small thing, which is when we think about what we've measured and, and how we can use that in a model. So, you know, as an experimentalist, you go in and you measure the connectome um, what that means is you have some connection on or off, or maybe probability in some sense, if you're very lucky, between two neurons. But, but as Adrian pointed out, there's a lot of other stuff going on. There's not just the external stuff to those neurons, like neuromodulators and peptides, but there's the genetic state of the neuron. What genes are methylated? What, you know, what are the things that are being produced in that neuron? And unfortunately, that is an enormously complicated system. If you think about the computational models we have of a gene regulatory network, it's a Turing complete system. That means it's, it's functionally able to do anything we could possibly imagine. And so unless you've also captured the whole state of that neuron, you don't necessarily know how it's going to react, what that node is going to do in the network. And so you're, you're in a situation where you can kind of always ask for more detail and you always want more information as a neuroscientist. I mean, we never, I assume everybody here, we're never satisfied that we have enough to work with our models or to try to answer a question. But just having that, that data isn't necessarily gonna answer the question for you, right? It's, it's a helpful part of a tool. So having the connecto may, may allow you to add or eliminate um, you know, various possible hypotheses but it won't by itself actually solve the problem for you. It, it isn't going to be the answer. Um, I wanted, uh, Adrian, do you want to describe a little bit more about um, Eve's uh, uh, work that, that, that showed that even in this really simple network where like C. elegans, you know the connections between all the neurons that in fact, it's more complicated when you look at it. Cause I think that's such a telling story of this problem. Right, yeah, and there's a wonderful literature about that that, that the guy, these guys might um, distribute to you. But um, Eve Mater worked uh, extensively and continues to work extensively on the on the crab stomatogastric ganglion, and there you have a very small number of neurons, which I not the number of which I forget, maybe it's four or something, you know, so tiny number of neurons, and and one knows the connections between them. But she and and you know her initial goal to you know Eve is a biologist and she started out many many years ago with the belief that many of us would come in that if we just knew the parameters of the underlying you know um, ion channels and the connections between the neurons that would be enough to specify what that ganglion should do right and what the dynamics of the network should do because it's pretty simple it's not too many neurons and if you should be able to do it anywhere you should be able to do it with a small number of neurons and what she found was that you could set many many different solutions to those parameters and you would get the network would work in a similar way and you can explore an enormous range of, of parameter space and find that there are regions in which it behaves in a certain way and um, that's very similar to real life and those regions aren't even next to each other right? there's kind of patches of regions of parameter space that all give a very similar uh, response and so she ended up feeling that asking about the exact values of parameters of real neurons is kind of a meaningless exercise that 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 is not the right question to be asking that that one really needs to kind of zoom out and ask more about you know so what is the computational range of such a structure of a network 
and that is perhaps more the better better way to think about it. And so I think we are in a, you know, Eve's lesson is, is one that we're still really scratching our heads, I think, and trying to figure out how to apply in this era where the Allen Institute are, you know, uh, gathering all this amazing data about single neuron composition and responses and connections between them and the exact nature of, of synapses. What is the next step with all that data? If we go back to even as simple a network as the crab somatogastric ganglion and we realize that, that you know, that there is a, a wide range of, of parameter space that all leads to similar results and that you can very easily walk off that parameter space with even a very small change in parameters and get something completely different. So, you know, how do we, someone asked an, another question earlier of sort of, how do we use this data? What is the right amount of data? And yeah, you know, I think I think we're in a you know rather head scratching <laughs> era where figuring out what is the right thing to do with data is is the next big big you know scientific challenge. And another take home message I think from Eve's work is is robustness of the biological system because all these different solutions to the same problem are essentially pointing out to the ability of the brain to find many different ways to address the same problem so that it doesn't fail, right? So we have many levels of, uh, of robustness along the way that we haven't really, I think, implemented in more theoretical approaches yet. And that's another lesson to learn and, and work that way. So it's not just that uh, too many details are not so important, but it's another way to ensure the robustness of the system. That'll be my take. Uh, I started a poll. I'm hoping everyone is filling it in. We have something like uh, 10, uh, 19 people, no, 16 already voted. So if you guys would take some time to fill in your votes to see whether you really like this day, it, it would have been great. And um, I'm sorry, but the, the, the next two questions are rather technical and I was told not to focus on those. Um, we can still take a couple because we have time, but uh, we would love to see more general questions about the principles of biological neurons, what you liked, what you didn't like, what you would like to see more. So feel free to ask more general questions. And until then, I will take one of the technical ones. In tutorial two, bonus two, and sample response was introduced. So I'm wondering whether we can apply this idea to the explanation of behaviors for population neurons. Uh, of neurons. For example, explain the frequency and the phase coupling of signals in EEG. Who would like to take this more technical, let's say, question? I can take that. So, yes, this is uh, exactly what we do when we try to model local field potentials or EEG, that uh, you try to create a coarse grained version uh, of the population. Um, you will do this tomorrow when you will work with rate models. That's where you will get to see uh, the average response of a network. And uh, uh, very briefly, we will touch upon oscillations. Um, and those are basically the models of oscillatory activity or phase coupling between different brain regions. Uh, yeah, so this will this is basically what we do. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Arvind. I have a question for, for, you. <laughs> for you, no, for the attendees actually. I mean, it would be nice to hear some comments on the chat. Um, in my outro, I introduced the dendrites. And this is something that is, uh, you know, something that you don't see in the Neuromage Academy, but also in, in generally in theoretical models, people tend to uh, leave them out because of their high complexity most of the time. So I would like to hear from the attendees whether you thought it was useful to learn about what dendrites do. It would be nice to get some answers from you guys. So type in. And if anyone wants to come live, that would also be great. Can I, can I ask you a question about that, Adrian? So, so I have, because I've had this discussion sometimes with uh, Michael Hauser, you know, who's very interested in, in experimentally exploring the properties, the active properties of dendrites and working with computational models of them. And there's this beautiful complexity and, and we, we've seen now that there's like lots of computational properties. In fact, one of the ways to model uh, a single pyramidal neuron is, is basically as a, a big deep network. I mean, I, I'm, I'm maybe being a little bit of, little bit of an exaggeration, but, but it has the same properties. You have these active components and the dendrites that can do nonlinear changes to the, the inputs. And, 
and and you know you're summing across thousands of inputs it's it's basically a, a neural network of the kind that's like those simpler ones we were using from McCullum Pitts or, or or you know classic multi-layer networks from the 80s and and so here's a question I have no idea what the answer is um, that could all be done to try to make that neuron when it's operating in a network operate in a stable coherent way for the rest of the neurons downstream so they can decode information or we could have just taken our already really hard and complex problem and exploded it you know by 10,000 times and i'm <laughs> i guess maybe 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 channeling a little bit about you know what you were saying about um uh, uh eve Actually, I guess this question could be for anybody. I mean, all of you. I don't. I don't know what the answer to this is. Um, but the the um, you know, think about what you were saying about Eve. Like, should we think about maybe that these uh, active dendrites are are part of a deep computational thing, or should we think that maybe we have to look for these larger global patterns, and maybe it's all being done for some actual simplification reason? And yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is, but. Yeah, it's a great, a great question that I also don't know what the answer is. <laughs> I probably Yurt is the right person to, to address that. You know, I, I think that we are, um, I, I love the kinds of work that Yota does and that, you know, all of us are trying to contribute to is revealing the power, right, of, of the underlying biology and how it can add complex computation that's way beyond what we're using in neural network models for our, for our individual elements. But does that mean that we really should be thinking about biological networks as having this explosion or, or are those things sort of concerted, like you know, the idea of synaptic scaling, for example, you know, that it's providing some kind of um, adjustment to kind of get rid of all of the very difficult issues about spatial distribution of, of inputs across, across a network. So Yota, what, what would you say to that? Well, of course, since I am a, a dendrite person, I would like to give them more credit, right? Uh, but yeah, I have to say, even in our work, the, the main advantages that we found so far that the dendrites provide to neurons or circuits are primarily resource savings. So the ability to solve the same task with using fewer resources. So it, so it is highly likely that dendrites are an evolutionary, let's say, advantage of the brain because of the limited skull and the low energy that it's, it has to operate on to allow the system to solve the same problems with using fewer neurons, doing it faster, compartmentalizing, let's say, the computations locally so that you have more power to do more of them and things like that. And in that sense, you can think of them as deep neural lens and replace them with deep. They may not even be that deep, right? They may, they may only be two layer or three layer ones, but still the analogy of a, a deep neural network, let's say, and replace them in a system with such an abstraction. I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, definitely that is one possibility. The other possibility is that they are used to isolate also the plasticity within different compartments and in different ways. And this may be a smarter, let's say, computation that we haven't explored yet in artificial neural networks. I mean, personally, I don't know the answer, but this is something exciting to look at in, in the years to come. There's yeah, definitely worth looking into. I have a question here. So I, I keep hearing this, that we can reduce a neuron to a, a multi-layer uh, network, ANN type, for instance. But how trainable is that? Because I, I don't think um, a multi-layer network is any useful if it can't be trained, right? So what, why wouldn't it be able to be trained? No, no, no. We are talking about, let's say, let's start with uh, uh, the idea that we can take distal dendrite as one compartment, then the middle one as another compartment, and then the third compartment of SOMA. So if we think of this as layers, or if we take your work where you try to say that, uh, or actually showed it, that uh, dendrites and the neurons, you can take it as a two-layer network. Mm -hmm. But then wouldn't it be necessary to be able to train the connections between the two layers? But this is something that is done in the brain, right? So I mean, what you is have... the physical correlate of that? I mean, there are no real uh, synapses, so to say there, right? But you have intrinsic plasticity. So you change the coupling between the dendrites and the soma. We know that. So this is one way to train these connections. You so also have... There is one single weight between the two layers then, or? There is one what? One so... weight that couples the, the, the one uh, the, no yeah. no there are multiple weights one weight for each dendrite 
it depends on the level of reduction that you want to do, right? In our model, each dendrite had its own weight. If you want to model the entire tuft as one thing, then there will be just one way. So it depends on the level of reduction. But there are ways to modify these connections evident in the real brain, right? That, that I mean, clear. Arvin, one way of thinking about it, right, is, is you either can have a synapse which does uh, filtering, right, and changes the effective transfer, or you could change the transfer function itself the, that, you know, is the integration and passing on in the network. And we know that we can insert and remove ion channels from a dendritic compartment due to changes in activity. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can basically amplify or, or reduce, you know, the, the information that's being passed along from that apartment, or maybe it's, it's nonlinearities by doing something that's not a synapse, but I mean, biology has so many tools that it's disposable to, to, to try to solve these problems. I guess my my take would be, I'm sure it could do it until we've really demonstrated that it can't. No, I, think, I, I think Rishi, that, yeah, Rishi that's could a very nice point. because he worked on it. I actually did not know that you can um, change ionic or uh, voltage dependent conductances in a localized manner in the membrane. So that's where my question is heading because this is what we will need, right, to train this. You can, you can. Uh, yeah, yeah, there, so are, you there can. are several uh, uh, studies that show that uh, intrinsic plasticity can be localized. Uh, so that was one of the initial mistakes that uh, people made that, uh, I mean, intrinsic plasticity was directly mapped onto global changes in intrinsic excitability. But in today's world where you can actually record from dendrites and look at the plasticity across the entire scale, it is now known that it can be um, localized to one particular dendritic segment. Uh, or one particular dendritic branch without affecting um, any other branches actually. And that improves the, the computational power associated with learning much more than what you would get with uh, just synaptic plasticity. So the um, bottom line is, I mean, synaptic plasticity is not the only show in town. So that's not why, it, why I raise my hand. Uh, uh, so um, I think of it as, uh, I mean, some kind of uh, um, fractal of networks, if you will. Um, so at each and every scale, uh, there are fundamental components uh, and there are specific forms of interactions, basically. So if you look at an ion channel, there are uh, these individual amino acids and how they interact with each other to give you this um, ion channel. Uh, and each ion channel has its own kind of functions. And, and at a phenomenological level, when you're looking at Hodgkin-Huxley models, for instance, uh, you don't look at the complexity of what amino acids went into making a sodium channel. Uh, you look at only activation inactivation properties and that is sufficient uh, for you to be able to study cellular level properties. So similarly, when you come to the cellular level, uh, you look at the kind of ion channels that are expressed in the, um, in the dendrites in the, in the cell body. And there are different components here uh, and they again interact with each other which we model as a couple differential equations uh, and say that, okay, if these are the kind of ion channels that are present and they interact like this, uh, then you would get this kind of an outcome. Again, when you are now uh, going to the network scale, uh, you don't need to have all the ion channels if your questions are not related to the individual ion channels. All you have to know is, uh, okay, this is a kind of neuron. Now uh, it gives me bursting kind of properties. And this is another kind of neuron, which is a regular spiking one. Uh, and I have this kind of interaction between them, the synaptic interaction between them. And uh, I'm interested in asking the question. So at each and every scale, uh, you have fundamental elements uh, and you have uh, uh, specific uh, uh, um, uh, interactions that uh, define how exactly these fundamental particles talk to each other. Uh, and that keeps changing. What exactly is fundamental in one scale uh, becomes uh, the emergent property in the previous scale and so on and so forth. And this kind of propagates. Uh, so it is important to ask us, I mean, we are not going to model the, the, the cosmic interactions by looking at uh, subatomic uh, interactions between leptons and quarks, obviously, right? So, so there is a necessity of what exactly the question is, uh, and that question should determine what kind of detail that goes into the model uh, rather than anything else. So I see it as a propagation of uh, um, the, the fundamental uh, interaction property, fundamental properties uh, and the interactions among them the emergent uh, uh, schemas that come out of that interactions in that particular scale, which propagate to the next scale, basically. So that's how I look at it. I don't see it as uh, um, some kind of, uh, I mean, we don't need to bother about this. We don't need to bother about that. Uh, there are question at, questions at each and every scale uh, that require answering, right? I mean, it's not like uh, the, the interactions between amino acids leading to a nicely formed uh, uh, protein structure. Uh, 
is any less important than uh, the set of uh, um, uh, neurons talking to each other in coming up with an emergent network property. So at each and every scale, there are questions that are necessary to be answered. Uh, and they have to be answered with the rigor that is uh, uh, required for answering that question. That's how I see it. Perfect. Thank you very much, Rishi. So I think I think we are done, but we can maybe take one last question because we started five minutes late. Uh, let's see. Okay, maybe the, the, the last one. I have observed that at least in today's tutorials, many of our models involve the leaky term or exponential term and would like to ask whether we generally observe this term in the brain. Arvind? I, by mistake, pressed the button that I answer. <laughs> I, I definitely didn't want to answer it, but I can I, say I something. It's, I mean, one can straightforwardly say that any um, neuron, you know, if you start from the very simplest model of a neuron, it's a passive membrane, right? And that's what gives you the exponential term. And then you dress that up with all kinds of stuff like ion channels that give you excitability. And so the very simplest model just assumes that it's just the passive membrane. There's no, there's no channels in it at all. And when you hit thresholds, then you spike, right? In real life, it's the interesting nonlinear dynamics of ion channels that cause that to happen. But you never get away from there being that underlying passive membrane property. What nonlinearity does is it can change the effective time constant of the of the of the passive membrane depending on the state of the ion channel but but that's where that comes from so yes it's definitely seen in the brain right it's it's a very fundamental principle of how a cell is built that it has a passive membrane and that's going to you know that's going to get influenced by the by the nonlinearities of ion channels absolutely uh, I just want to remind the people that the poll is running for another minute. We have 32 out of 41 already voted, so it would be nice to get everyone. This is important for the organizers to know how to change the material, material for the next uh, the Neuromatch Academy. So, so far, I am the only one that can see the results. <laughs> and it seems that the people were not thrilled with the real neurons. Uh, <laughs> they don't find the, the details too important, I guess. Uh, but now let's wait a few more minutes, a couple of more minutes to see whether this view will change. So those of you who really liked real neurons and then read, cast your votes. I think they were wrongly primed with the previous two weeks. Yeah, I think so. So we should have started with this uh, day. Exactly. <laughs> oh, well, well, I think, you know, uh, talking about the complex thing, the it's not fair to just uh, focus on spiking generation. I mean, just for spiking generation, we could simplify it. But uh, as you said, the uh, plasticity is important. Different amino acids genes interact. There is a uh, immune responses, etc. Things are happening at very different scales. And what's optimal or what's useful there um, is non-trivial. Um, we have to taking into consideration a variety of scales. So. Yeah, yeah that, that's a very good point, indeed. I, I, maybe but I want to be... If you know, oh, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think, I think one of the things that, that... One of the reasons to go back and look at the history of, of neural networks and what's led to you know, the modern deep neural networks, which are doing these amazing things that, that get a lot of uh, us really excited, and especially a lot of students really excited, is to, to see how almost all of the big leaps forward have been by going back and thinking about the neurobiology or sometimes the behavior of systems. Um, and then, you know, and then they do really clever things with those insights and the engineering moves forward and the power of computational machinery moves forward and it allows us to scale those up. But then often what happens is, you know, there's, there's some limit to how far you can drive those sort of purely, let's call them machine learning approaches. Uh, because, of course, the brain has had millions of years to optimize, um, you know, this was being answered by Yota and, and Adrian about the dendritic compartment. Maybe this is a system that allows us to subcompartmentalize a computation in a way that's incredibly clever. And if we don't add this to our deep nets, they will never be as intelligent as we are. I mean, we don't know the answer to that. But my bet is, because evolution has given 
uh, uh, you know, the brain a lot of tools that have been refined over a lot of time to do things, you know, basically to be energy efficient and computationally efficient. Uh, it means that there's probably a lot more insights to come from really actually thinking about and understanding these biological details. So you shouldn't get, um, yeah, you should think that this day was fun, even if it doesn't seem to help you identify a cat or a dog from a photo on the internet. It, it's probably a place to go back to. And generally, you know, going back to the neuroscience is going to be a place to go to, to get inspiration on how to solve the deep problems going forward. Absolutely. So I'm sharing the results of the poll. I don't know if you can see them. We got 54%. Uh, so the question was, did you enjoy learning about and working with real neurons? First answer, the first choice was it was awesome. The second, it was fun. The first one uh, was voted by 54% of the attendees, the other one by 69. So it was fun, <laughs> but not awesome. Uh, well, that's good enough, I guess. Um, and I think it's time to, that's a rather biased answer panel. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to say that, Yota, you didn't uh, uh, put another question. Was it not fun? <laughs> well, I was instructed by the organizers to use only positive uh, options. So it's not my fault. Huh? <laughs> but anyway, it's not a democratic thing either way. So. Yeah, well, it, it was You have fun. to learn hard things as well, so. Yeah, I guess. But I yeah, think- I do, you know, before we all sign out, I do, um, worry sometimes that neuroscience is going too much in a direction of just make a neural network that does the thing that the brain does and that's going to mean that you understand the brain it's just not true you know the brain is a piece of biology there's so much we don't understand about biology and if we want to be able to interact with biology to do things with actual brains to solve problems that arise in actual brains we do really have to understand the biology too and it's not just um, it's beautiful and it's fun and it's amazingly complex and intriguing. So there's an awful lot to do without having to worry about that, but you really, um, we're nowhere near the beginning, I think, of, of understanding true brains from the biological side. So there's lots, lots, of, lots of work to do <laughs> remaining. And I, I hope that you don't go away from the course feeling that things are kind of all nailed down because you can fit a deep neural network. That's just not, not true about understanding the brain, even though we, we didn't want to use that phrase. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but anyway, it all depends on, on your current research project and what you're really interested in, right? That for some people, it's really amazing to understand what the brain does. For others, it's just a tool to move on to a different subject. So it's also a rather, let's say biased question. Right. Uh, in, but in, also I think if you want to make a research career, this is where the open questions are. There are so many aspects of biology. We still don't know how many of those are relevant for computation and how much is just housekeeping of the biological part of the, of the brain, right? And so, here there are so many questions that you can ask and answer and make you know, a name for yourself. So I think research-wise, this is perhaps a very fertile area. Absolutely. Absolutely. And intellectually more satisfying because these are real questions uh, and you'll have to find real answers uh, rather than making up your own questions and answering them. <laughs> well, great. Um, I think this was a very cool session. I hope people enjoyed it. I certainly did. Um, I don't know if you guys want to say something to be before we close, feel free. No? Okay. So then I would like to thank all the panelists and all the attendees for their excellent questions, for the discussion and wish you a lovely day. And thank you for being here. Thanks. And thanks everyone for, for great questions. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, all. Yeah, thanks. thanks for moderating it. Thank yes. you everybody. Bye-bye.